Good morning and welcome to Christian Baptist Church. If this is your first week joining with us, we're really glad that you've joined us here today. If you're joining uh, on from Facebook Live, welcome. Uh, you're very welcome to join us each and every Sunday as we worship the Lord together. This week uh, in particular, an exciting week uh, as we're heading into probably one of the most uh, special weeks on the Christian calendar, uh, the week of Easter and this week being Palm Sunday. Uh, we have a special service that's coming up. You'll hear about it a little bit later uh, in the announcements after the service. But don't forget, to 10 a.m. on Friday morning, we're going to have a good Friday service uh, here at the church uh, as well. We are glad that you've come to join us uh, to worship uh, because our God is worthy of what we're worshiping. Today, Palm Sunday, what a great example as Jesus himself rode into the city of Jerusalem, and the people in Jerusalem bowed down. They put their cloaks down on the ground, the very jackets and coats that they were wearing. They took palm branches. They tore them from the trees around them and waved them. Hosanna, the king is here to save us. And that's what we're here to celebrate today. Jesus, the king. Um, but I have a question for you. Have you ever had to wait for anything? Have you ever had to wait for something really good? In my life, the most terrible, awful thing to wait for was Sunday dinner. We would come in after church, and we would walk in the front door of my mom and dad's house, and the house smelled like any feast you could ever imagine in heaven. The roast beef, often the roast beef was cooking in the oven, and the smell was so good, and we would have to wait I'm telling you, maybe a whole 30 minutes before we could sit down at the table. Uh, and what a wait that would be. Uh, today, we're going to learn about what it means to wait on the Lord uh, as we come together in worship. Um, Grace, this morning, as we open up our service, would you uh, open our time in prayer? Yes, let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for this amazing day that we can come together and worship you on Palm Sunday morning. Lord God, each of us have come through different experiences this week, and you know each of our joys and our accomplishments and our struggles and our pain. And God, you know all the good and the bad that we've gone through, and we thank you that you're there for us through it all. Thank you for listening to our prayers. And God, thank you that you have a plan for everybody and everything, even though we don't understand it at times. And thank you that you've had a plan from the beginning to send your son, Jesus, and for making a way for us so that we can be set free through your death on the cross. And so today, God, on this special Sunday, we praise you and we thank you for your plan, uh, your plan to conquer death, to give us life. Thank you for loving us that much. So we praise you, God, we worship you, and we ask that you would help us listen today and be open to whatever lesson it is that you have for us to learn about waiting on you, Lord, as we wait and look forward to when you return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Grace. Donna, would you uh, read our scripture for this morning? Okay. Oh, actually, no. Sorry, Stephen, you're going to play a song for us next.
Right on. Thank you, Stephen. Donna, would you uh, read scripture this morning? Good morning. I'm reading scripture, passage of scripture from John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. And I'm reading from the New um, Living Translation. Uh, the passage of scripture in my Bible is titled The Triumphal Entry. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept throughout the city. A huge crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Israel. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't realize at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered that these scriptures had come true before their eyes. Those in the crowd who had seen Jesus cause Lazarus back to death were telling others all about it. That was the main reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this mighty miracle. Then the Pharisees said to each other, we've lost. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate that. So back to my question earlier, have you ever waited for something? Sure you have. What are you waiting for right now? For some of you, it might be waiting for the Leafs to win the Stanley Cup again. Hi, Russell. For others, it might be uh, waiting for summer or waiting to get back to work. Some others are waiting for things to speed up and others for things to slow down. I think all of us are waiting for this coronavirus pandemic to end, waiting for the end of masks, waiting to hug some friends or family again. We're waiting to get things back to normal, although I'm not sure what that means anymore. It strikes me how important the word waiting is in the Bible and how important it is to God. One of the most important things that God calls his people to do is to wait on the Lord. Even though God promises special blessings for those that wait, waiting is difficult. Why? Maybe because our sins, we're so prone to take matters into our own hands, to follow our own schemes. Yet over and over again in scripture, we're told to wait on the Lord. Waiting is something that you really want to happen or for something that you really want to happen. It's a difficult thing to do. And waiting is no more difficult today than it was 2,000 years ago on the first Palm Sunday. You see, God's people have been waiting for thousands of years, generation after generation of waiting. From the fall of man to the Garden of Eden and throughout all of the Old Testament, God's people had been waiting for the coming of the Messiah, their Savior, their true King. Their wait was difficult, highs and lows along the way, wars, famines, death, defeat, foreign occupation and religious corruption, even disease and plagues and government restrictions. God's faithful people had to wait. Here's my definition of waiting. This is according to the Dictionary of Andrew. Waiting is actively participating in my father's business until he calls me home for dinner. And if we could look back 2,000 years, everyone alive in Israel on that first Palm Sunday were waiting, hoping, praying, and dreaming that this very moment would actually happen in their lifetime. God had been waiting too. Since before the creation of the world, and certainly since the Garden of Eden, God was waiting to announce the arrival of Jesus and bring salvation to mankind, opening a way for man to be made right again with God like they were in the garden. God had always been with his people in waiting. But on that first Palm Sunday, the wait was over and Jesus' time had come. Jesus boldly announced that he was indeed the king. According to the plan of man, uh, it wouldn't have happened this way. 
they were looking for a ruler who would come in authority, but rather, according to the plan of God, he came in peace, as revealed by the prophets, as revealed by the word of God. You see, Jesus was the Messiah, predicted by the prophets, but not the Messiah expected by the people. They wanted a Messiah who would overthrow Rome, who would restore the nation to its former glory under King David. On the first Palm Sunday, 2,000 years ago, Jesus enters Jerusalem with royalty, and he enters Jerusalem freely. He was not a prisoner. He was not hiding. He was not in a hurry. Jesus arrived on his divinely appointed schedule. Jesus acted deliberately and with purpose as he rode into the city, making his claim to be both king and messiah. Jesus knew his enemies were watching. He rode into town boldly. He wanted them to see him being treated like a king. He knew they were soon going to drag him into court and treat him like a criminal. But before they did, they needed to see, they needed to take one more look at the real plan of God. The plan to give the people one more chance to step out of the crowd, to step out and join the parade. Yes, the time had come to make the ultimate decision. The people had to either acknowledge Jesus as their king, or they needed to renounce him as an insurrectionist. Ooh, that's an awful word today, isn't it? The time had come for Jesus to fight the great battle with Satan, sin, and death, and the lines were being drawn. The time had come for Jesus to finish the work that the Father had sent him to do. The time had come for the king to claim his rightful place on the throne. So let's look at the book. Um, I appreciate, Donna, you reading scripture for us this morning. Thank you so much. Turn to John chapters 11 and 12. We're going to look at that probably as our primary text this morning. So if you've got your Bible with you, flip it open. John chapter 11 and 12. We'll focus primarily on 12 and then over into the Gospel of Matthew a little bit later. So Bethany was a town that was just a few kilometers east of Jerusalem. Uh, it's a small village. Uh, on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. Uh, between Bethany and Jerusalem is a little village on the way up called Bethphage. The Mount of Olives stands high above the city of Jerusalem, and it overlooks the temple just ac across the Kidron Valley. In Luke chapter, uh, sorry, in uh, John chapter 11, Jesus had been summoned by the friend's uh, by friends that he had because Lazarus, a dear friend, was sick. In fact, he was so sick that Lazarus dies as a result of the sickness. Jesus comes to the tomb, and as a demonstration of who he is and a demonstration of his authority, he raises Lazarus back to life. It's now Saturday night, six days before the Passover is about to begin. And a dinner is being given in Jesus' honor, likely because of what he had done in raising Lazarus. That seems reasonable, right? So Martha, the sister of Lazarus, is busy preparing food and serving the many guests that have gathered. Jesus and Lazarus are sitting at the table. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a vivid imagination. Can you imagine perhaps what the conversations might have been around the table? The guests must have been asking Lazarus and Jesus a million questions. Lazarus, could you actually hear Jesus when you were dead? Lazarus, what was it like when you were dead? Jesus, what authority do you have that can call a dead man back to life? They probably hung on every word that they said. Others were celebrating the miracle that had taken place, and they had small conversations amongst themselves. And still others were having conversations about the very meal they were eating and how much they were enjoying it. But just then, 
Lazarus's other sister, Mary, walks into the room. And she sits down at the feet of Jesus. And the room quiets as she takes a pint of pure nard and breaks it open. The fragrance immediately fills the room, as does silence. She then takes that nard and she pours it on the feet of Jesus in front of all of the guests. And even more, she then takes her hair and she anoints the feet by rubbing her hair and the oil into his feet. The room must have been silent as the perfume filled the house. Now let's look at John 12, starting at verse 4. The scriptures read this. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was the one to later betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold for money and given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and the keeper of the money bag. He used to help himself to what was put in it. But Jesus said, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me with you. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. On account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Just a side note here. Isn't it interesting to see how far people will go when they do not like the truth on display? Sorry, that's just a side thought. The next day, according to the scriptures, the next day, verse 12, the great crowd that had come for the feast of Passover heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. Okay, now I want you to take your Bible and go over to Matthew chapter 21. We're going to start right at verse 1 there. Matthew 21 and 1. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples ahead, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and the, at once you will find a donkey who is tied there with her colt by her side. Untie them both and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought out the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks out for them for Jesus to sit on. Okay, now, I don't know about you, but if you have ever noticed this before, what's happening here is um, Jesus was traveling on a donkey. All of scripture says Jesus walked from this place to that place. The one exception is when he got in a boat, and we noted that just a couple of weeks ago. But in every other situation, when Jesus walked, or when Jesus was on the, the, uh, the earth, he didn't take a donkey, he didn't ride a horse, he didn't do everything, anything other than travel by foot from place to place. Not only is Jesus fulfilling prophecy here by riding on a donkey, and the stark contrast needs to be noted. He is fulfilling prophecy from Zechariah 9 verse 9. His actions are literally announcing that he is not just the king of Israel, but he's making a statement about the very nature of the kingdom that he's bringing. Jesus was not riding on a great white horse. 
to make war with Rome and overthrow it, but rather he was coming on a donkey. That is exactly what a king would do if he was coming to the people and riding in in peace. But it's not what the people of Israel wanted or expected. Okay, back to the book, back to verse 8 there. A very large crowd spread out their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went out ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Okay, stop for a moment. The people that were there got it. They knew what was going on. Fathers would have told their sons when they gathered at nighttime to share stories together. Grandmothers, while they were preparing and caring for the family, they would tell their granddaughters and their daughters. They were quoting Psalm 118, which is a messianic prov uh, promise that had been written some 750 or more years prior to this. But they had memorized it because they were anticipating. They were waiting for this very day. The king was about to enter Jerusalem. Okay, back to the book. Hosanna, which means save us now, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven, they shouted. Full stop. I want us to look at this for a few moments because we need to look at these timeless truths. These truths about Jesus that just might help us in our time of waiting for the Lord, just as we are calling out and waiting on the Lord for some very important things in our lives, perhaps in our families. The reason these are timeless truths is because they were true 2,000 years ago when Jesus made the trip from Bethany up into Jerusalem, and they are still true for you and I today. The first truth is this, wait on the Lord because Jesus is worth more than my possessions. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, took a pint of pure nard. Now, I must admit to you that if I was going to call a perfume something, I wouldn't choose nard. However, nard must have been a nice sounding word back then, but it's extremely expensive perfume. And it comes from a plant called spicknard or spikenard. And this plant came from not the outside of Jerusalem, not from the edge of Israel. It actually came from a Himalayan plant some 4,825 miles, give or take, sorry, kilometers away. No wonder this plant costs so much to make into perfume with it having come so far. Then she takes this perfume, this beautiful smelling perfume in an alabaster jar and breaks it open never to be able to be sealed again. She takes it and she pours it on the feet of Jesus. Then she takes her hair and she rubs it in to the feet. Nard was so expensive, the scriptures say that it was worth about a year's wages. Begging the question, how much do we make in a year? Oh, that's a side note, of course. See, Mary saw Jesus for who he is, the Christ, the son of the living God. She knew what Jesus was doing. She knew that arrest and likely death was coming to Jesus because he prophesied it. He spoke it clearly to the disciples prior to that. He knew, she knew what was happening when Jesus the next day would come into Jerusalem. Mary knew who the guests were that were gathered that wanted both Lazarus and Jesus put to death. But Mary wanted to do something that would express her great love for Jesus. She wanted to do something for Jesus while she still had an opportunity to do it. So Mary took the most expensive thing that she had, that alabaster jar of expensive perfume, 
And Mary knelt down at the feet of her Lord and she broke it open and she anointed the feet with oil of the perfume. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15, that a woman's crown and glory was her hair. And Mary takes her crown and wipes the feet of Jesus. No sacrifice was too costly for her. No service was too humiliating for Mary because she got it. Knowing who Jesus is, is more than any of our possessions. Yes, Mary got it. Begging the question, do I get it? Is there something I'm holding on to that I need to pour out for Jesus? Is there something that I'm holding on to that is so precious that I may not be willing to give up for him? Jesus is worth more than my possessions. Do I believe that? Second, we're to wait on the Lord because Jesus is more appealing than our religion. Listen, John 12, 12 says this. It says, the next day a great crowd that had come from the, for the feast of Passover heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. Do you know how great that crowd was? I was curious this week, so I, I looked it up. And some many Bible scholars actually say that the crowds that were in Jerusalem that day were somewhere in the area of a million and possibly more. Their religion told them to come to Jerusalem. It was a duty, a responsibility. God did not. Their religion told the people that every year they should go to Jerusalem for three main feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. It was their religion, and they were expected to obey the religion. As Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, the large crowd had come to celebrate the Passover, the annual reminder of the time when God delivered his people from 400 plus years of slavery in Egypt. These were religious people performing a religious duty. But make no mistake here, these people wanted more than what their religion was giving them. That's partly why they came back year after year. They knew the corruption of the Pharisees and of the religious leaders. They got the infiltration of how Rome and the, the, the Jewish religion had come together so that the people could survive. They knew that the Pharisees were turning the temple celebrations into a show and that the money was a burden to the poor people and it was too much for them to carry. But when the people had gathered for the Passover heard that Jesus was coming, the city gates were crowded with people. For some reason, they got it. This man that they had heard for years who had been healing blind people, had cleansed leprous people, had made deaf people speak, or sorry, deaf people hear and, and uh, dumb people speak. This man was coming into Jerusalem and they lined those rules, those roads because he had made a dead man come back to life. They took the palm branches and they went out to meet him. Could it be, could it be that today was that very day? Jesus is so much more appealing than the religion that they were suffering through. He is so much more appealing than the rules and the regulations that religion places on people. Obey this, act like this, dress like this, don't dress like that. When you're in public, talk like this. When you're in private, talk like this. This is how you do and this is how you don't. Jesus was like a breath of fresh air blowing into the religious rules and the burdens of that day. And he still is today. 
You see, religion emphasizes an outward show of what we need to look like. But Jesus emphasizes an inward change of our hearts. Jesus cares about the heart. And he knows the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Religion focuses on what we're not allowed to do. But Jesus is about freedom. Religion says, thou shalt not. But Jesus came to give you life. He didn't abolish the law. He fulfilled the law. Religion puts up barriers, but Jesus pulls down walls. Religion keeps people out, but Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Galatians 3, 26 and 28 says this. So in Christ Jesus, you are children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is not female nor male. For you are all one in Jesus Christ. Religion says, work on your way to God. Jesus says, I am your way to God. Religion is performance-based while Jesus offers us grace. So, you want some really good news? Faith in Jesus is not about how much I can do for God to make him like me. It's about how much God has done for me to demonstrate his love for me. Yay, God. Third, waiting on the Lord, we need to wait on the Lord because scripture is more reliable than opinions. Listen, everybody has an opinion about something today. I mean, everybody. And I'm telling you, you even put two people on the same side of the scope together and you get them in a room and they're going to have an opinion about an opinion about an opinion. No one can agree on almost anything today. Everyone had an opinion about who Jesus was back then too. But not everyone was right. You see, some said he was Elijah. Well, others thought he was John the Baptist come back to life. Still others thought he might have been a new kind of prophet. However, there were others, like the religious leaders, that said that he was not only not from God, but he was a madman and must be possessed by a demon. Were any of those people correct in their opinions of Jesus? No. Two times in the gospel accounts of the triumphal entry, you will see the Holy Spirit guiding the writers of scripture to write two different Old Testament passages that make Jesus' identity abundantly clear to us. One of them is Zechariah 9, and the other one is Psalm 118. They were written some four to 500 years apart from each other. But these two scriptures declare that Jesus was the Messiah. They even declared how he was going to enter the city of Jerusalem. And here's some more good news. The Bible is more reliable than the opinions of men. Today, almost everyone has an opinion about almost everything. They have opinions about Jesus and about what is true and what is fake news. When their opinion is more reliable than the Bible, then we can stop and talk and listen to their opinion. But real security does not come into our lives until we are willing to be governed by the authority of everything written in this book. If we do not allow the book to govern our lives, then we walk around in circles in the dark, crashing into each other. Look, I know I say it week after week, but if I was not taught as a child and the, the church that I went to and the family that I was raised in that scripture is important, I don't know where I'd be today. Listen, I'm not joking about that. These words are life. 
And if we go into life without knowing what the word says, we're no better than blind men walking in circles. Real security comes when our lives are governed by the word of God. And it gives us freedom. And that, my friend, is good news. I don't have to rely on Fox and I don't have to rely on CNN. I can rely on God's word. And it never changes. Fourth, wait on the Lord because following Jesus is more important than watching in the crowd. Listen, this world wants to watch and sit in the crowd. They sometimes like to participate in the crowd and wave placards and banners about whatever it is that is the, the motion of the day. But there were hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem, most of them watching what was going on, at least aware of what was happening when Jesus rode into the city in peace on the donkey. There were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Lazarus. There were Roman guards and soldiers. There were religious leaders who were furious at what was going on. There were curious people standing on the sidelines. There were insurrectionists. There's a word for us for today. And even zealots gripping their swords, hoping that Jesus was about to lead a rebellion. But there were also 11 men, just 11, who were committed to following him, even to the point of death. Sure, they made mistakes, and yes, they were, in, in colloquial terms, they were classic screw-ups. They made all kinds of mistakes, including denying Jesus. Listen, it is good to watch. It is good to observe. But if my observation of Jesus doesn't lead me to participation, then it's nothing more than constipation. Fifth, we need to wait on the Lord because surrender is better than rejection. Go back to the book. This time I want you to flip over to Luke. Luke chapter 19. This is a different account of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Luke 19, starting at verse 39 to 44, it says this, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, an embankment against you and will encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. The word translated wept here means more than just shedding a few tears or being sad. It actually suggests that Jesus bawled, that his whole body heaved and sobbed, and his body shook with emotion. It was a deep, soul-filled suffering, like a person who had just lost a dear loved one. Jesus wasn't crying because he was about to leave and suffer and die. He wasn't about to bawl his eyes out and weep over the fate of, of just mere strangers. No, he was weeping at the fate of those who would come to Jerusalem and the fate that would come upon Jerusalem in just a few short days and years. In AD 70, the army of Rome came in and completely destroyed Jerusalem and its temple. Instead of enjoying the very real joyful shouts and praises of the people, Jesus felt the screams, the cries, the shrieks, the groans of men and women and children who would soon die in that city. Perhaps Jesus could see the burning buildings, the city turned to rubble, 
Maybe he could smell the odor of smoke and of death. Jesus came to his own, but his own did not accept him. Jesus wept for those who would reject the gift of salvation that he was bringing on that great day. Jesus wept for those who would reject him as their king. He wept for those who could not see the peace that he came to bring. And it begged the question as I was reading it this week, was he weeping for me? There were only two times where Jesus wept in all of the Gospels. Now, he may have cried at other times, but two recorded times in Scripture, and I think it's profound. The first was outside of the tomb of Lazarus in John eleven thirty five, 35. And the second was right here in Luke chapter 19. The reason we are told so many times in the Bible to wait on the Lord is because surrender is better than rejection and following is better than watching the word of god is more reliable than man's opinions and jesus is more appealing than religion and jesus is more valuable than our possessions that's why we wait so i'm going to ask the question again what are you waiting for are you tired of waiting you've prayed you've asked god to answer or to relieve and you don't think it's happening and you think just maybe god is too far away or doesn't care enough about you maybe you're in a job situation that's really tough to endure right now and you're waiting and hoping that conditions will change for the better. Maybe you're waiting because you don't have a job and you're hoping that some news could come on an application that you sent out. Maybe you've been sick for a while and you're waiting on your health to improve. And maybe you've been on a diet and you're waiting for just a few more pounds to finally come off. Perhaps you're single and you're waiting right now for Mr. or Mrs. Wright. And just maybe you're waiting for a child to come back home who has left a long time ago. <clears throat> maybe you've hoped that they would come back to the faith that they had once believed. Let me go back to my definition of waiting for you. Waiting is the active participation in my father's business until he calls me home for dinner. And oh, what a feast that will be. Okay, back to the book for just a moment. Psalm 103. Psalm 103 in the Old Testament, verses 13 to 19. It says this. Just as the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He is mindful that we are nothing other than dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As for a flower of the field, he flourishes for only a day. But when the wind is passed over it, it is no more and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And those who fear him and his righteousness to, chil to his children's children, to those who have kept his covenant and to those who remember to obey his commands. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. And Psalm 27 verse 14 says this, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, probably the most difficult 
thing for me to do in life is to wait when I need an answer now. Probably the most difficult thing for me to do is to wait when I have some business that needs to be taken care of now. God, so often I want to take my plans and my ways, lay them out and run headstrong into them. And yet you have reminded me, you have reminded us today so many times, you have said to us, wait on me. And perhaps, oh God, that's just like it was in the garden when you weren't holding something good back from Adam and Eve, you were telling them, wait, trust me, I have a better way. And yet we, just like Adam and Eve, run to go to our own way, run to find our own plan, to make our own way in the middle of our own desert. When you offer us an oasis of life that comes only in knowing Jesus. God, I sense that there are people on this call today that are frustrated with waiting on so many things. And like most of them, we confess together that we are impatient. Even with this COVID-19 thing. But we make a deliberate choice, Lord, today to wait on you because there is nothing greater than you. There is no one greater than Jesus. And it is only in accepting what he has done for us on the cross that we can have life. Lord, I pray for patience which is not an easy thing to pray for. But I ask that you would cause us to learn the joy of waiting until the day that is revealed in your resurrection that we see you again. So God, I ask this because we need you in Jesus' name. You are holy God, and we thank you for that. Amen. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the down and worship him now how great how awesome is he and together we sing everyone sing holy is the lord
Today, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at Jesus. He's here. The question that we have, we have to face, is how will we approach his coming? This is called the Holy Week. We're looking forward to, we're anticipating this great Easter celebration. This coming Friday, we will look and we will remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. But we are looking forward to the Sunday, the resurrection, the reminder that Jesus has conquered the grave, that he has conquered all that is causing our grief. He is the waiting personified in completion. Jesus has completed the work, and we're waiting for that day that we get to see him face to face. For those of you who have joined us through Facebook Live, thank you so much. We're really glad that you've joined us. Um, we take a time now to break from that and to pray for each other's needs within our congregation. If you'd like to join us live for that prayer time, I'd encourage you to join us on Zoom next Sunday um, or this coming week on Friday uh, as we're going to be celebrating at 10 a.m. on Good Friday. Uh, but you can feel free to join us during that time and, and we'll take time to pray for each other's needs. So thank you, Facebook Live. Uh, God bless you, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week.